Who has the right to defend themselves? Is it the occupier or the occupied? Think with me. For so long, the world has adopted terminologies and words that have led to the killing of our children, that have flipped things upside down for decades. It's we who have the right to defend itself, not the occupier. Ambassador, this is a complex situation and not everybody even understands who is who. So let me just begin by asking you, for those who don't know the detail, you are the Palestinian ambassador. You are, you speak for the Palestinian government in the West Bank. So what is your relationship with the authorities in Gaza and with Hamas? Let me correct that. I speak uh, on behalf of the Palestinians wherever they are, in the West Bank, in Gaza, and in the refugee camps and in the exile outside. Uh, I represent the state of Palestine, which is or, uh, recognized by the majority of the world, minus few countries, including the UK, and has a seat in the UN. Uh, and that uh, state has a government. And the government of that state is the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. That government represents every Palestinian inside and outside. That government is legitimate. It's not challenged by any Palestinian, including Hamas for that matter. And that government is the re recognized by the region and the globe and the world as the sole legitimate uh, representative of the Palestinian people. That's why I had the PLO office in London. I used to have the PLO office or mission uh, embassy in, in Washington. So this is the situation. So let's not confuse states and governments with political factions. So what is your relationship to the Hamas authorities and Hamas as a movement? They're, 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 your, they're your rivals, your enemies, what, what are they? I mean, uh, they, they, they were rivals and, and they uh, were part of national elections in 2006 and they did win uh, uh, the parliamentary elections and uh, we did hand in power and they formed the government. And regrettably, regrettably, in 2007, a coup d'etat happened by Hamas, whereby since then we have been trying to achieve a reconciliation a deal to reunite uh, Gaza and the West Bank geographically and politically and reinstate uh, uh, the unity of our political system and people. So there are negotiations going on right now. As we speak, this is Monday at our time of recording. This is the last agreed day of the ceasefire and hostilities. There are negotiations to try and extend this with the release of more Palestinians and more Israelis uh, by each side. Are you part of this at all? Are you consulted? Are you, does anyone ring you and tell you what's happening? Of course. Uh, I think uh, our president has visited in the last few days and weeks by almost all world leaders. And I think uh, we are engaged in the real diplomacy here, um, not only the small little security details of uh, hostage exchanges, which is happening in Qatar and uh, with the help of Egypt and other regional countries, uh, but the key, uh, the key coordination is happening via the state of Palestine and the president of the state of, uh, of Palestine and the government of the state of Palestine. And th this is uh, the working with everybody to achieve a full comprehensive ceasefire. These poses serve nobody. Uh, the work to immediately uh, start a massive humanitarian assistance. People are in a, a state of unprecedented destitute. Those who were displaced to the south now have nowhere else to go. The weather conditions are horrible. No food, no water, no medicine. You're talking about unimaginable uh, uh, carnage in Gaza right now. We are also focusing on preventing a second Nakba because the what Israel did since the beginning of the situation has nothing to do with eradicating Hamas. What Israel was doing was a classic design of a second Nakba, of ethnic cleansing. By second Nakba, you mean the removal of <laughs> the Palestinian people from, from Gaza completely, do you mean? No, this is not what I mean. This is what has happened. Israel has displaced 1.7 million Palestinians in Gaza. That is three of every four Gazans now have been forced to leave their homes from the north to the south. But there are still hundreds of thousands of people in the north, including my own family, that's still there. They didn't leave. They have nowhere to go to the south. And those who left to the south are still being bombed. And if you follow what happened, Israel started by the most terrorizing airstrikes against civilians. That's a classic way of pushing them out. They destroyed their homes, then hospitals, schools, bakeries playgrounds, UN shelters. All this is to turn Gaza into unlivable. So what has taken place over the last month and a half was a classic case of ethnic cleansing. Now, people are still gathered in huge numbers in the south. People are still disconnected in the north. Israel is preventing people now with the truce 
to return back to their homes in the north and preventing humanitarian assistance from re reaching the north. Why do you think they're doing that? Can you explain? I mean, because <laughs> Israel kept saying we are warning people to get, to get to safety, to leave the north because that's where we are going to attack. If your own family stayed there, as example, why, why didn't they leave? to save their, their own lives. Because they see that uh, people who left were bombarded everywhere. They see that the South is not spared. They see that Israel has already called on major cities like Khan Yunis in the South to evacuate. They see that if they, they leave their home, they're killed anyway. So they, they decided, you know what, if Israel is gonna kill us, let it kill us in our own home. And I think this is about hundreds of thousands, not just my family. And therefore, this whole thing has got nothing to do with Israel's declared aim of fighting Hamas or eradicating Hamas. From day one, the plan is very clear. The plan is to eradicate the Palestinian people. And by the way, Krishna, not only in Gaza, follow what has happened in the West Bank in the last few weeks. See how many Palestinians were killed by the Israeli army and the illegal settler militias, illegal settler terrorist groups. 230 were killed, 1,000 Palestinians in the West Bank were depopulated. Maybe in the West Bank, the ethnic cleansing is happening at a slower scale, but it is happening and it's the same. That's the, blue, that's the blueprint and on the disk of the Israeli government with Netanyahu, with Ben Gvir and Smotrich. They have used the events of the 7th of October to inflict on the Palestinian people a second Nakba. Let me explain the ethnic cleansing, the mass expulsion of the Palestinian people. This is what happened since the 7th of October until today. Can I, can I ask you about your personal experience then, as you have family in Gaza? Have you, have you lost family members? I did, yes. And uh, early on, second day of the onslaught, second day of the Israeli assault, I lost my cousin Aya, her husband, two of her children, her mother-in-law, her father-in-law. They just bomb houses. They were sitting, they were sleeping. And if you go to the north of Gaza and also the south, the, you will not believe your eyes. People have no homes to go back to. People have no schools to go back to. They have made it absolutely clear that they will not allow for life to exist in Gaza. So, so you tell that's, me that's, that. You see, that, life, that Gaza should be unlivable. That's, that's the plan. I mean, you, you tell me that, and I'm sure you're used to telling people that now because it happened some weeks ago. But what is your emotional response? <clears throat> to what has happened to your own family and your own people? You know, I, I don't want to turn this personal, but uh, a couple of days ago, I have a sister who lives in the South. And because, because she lives in the South, she had to receive 175 of her friends and extended family to host them because the North was supposedly dangerous and uh, the South would be safer. And a couple of days ago, she calls me. She's a lawyer. She's a very tough person, very solid to be able to host all these people and with love and passion and with solidarity, sharing uh, their bread and sharing their water. And you know how scarce all these things are. And then she says with her broken voice, they've just, she said, Hussam, my brother, crying. They've just bombed the home next to me. She said there were a hundred people in there, civilians and women. I said, God, she said, I saw a woman cuddling her child and completely burnt and she flew right behind my window, and I can look at her now. I cannot take this anymore, she told me. This is what our children are seeing, Krishna. And the question now is what will come out of this? The question now, how these children are going to feel about what they have just seen? How an entire nation will absorb this? Especially in light of what they have seen in terms of the unprecedented failure in the part of the world. Exactly. So and the, the, the unprecedented is... double standards in the part of the West particularly. This is a moment when we eat, we are at a fork. We are at a fork. And I don't want to dramatize this and tell you what the people in Gaza and in the West Bank have been witnessing in the last weeks and in the last 75 years, you have know it. But some of the accounts are horrifying. Savagery, barbarism, barbarism. Unbelievable, unbelievable in our day that Israel is allowed to normalize the mass murder of children, the mass destruction of hospitals, of churches, of mosques, of, of UN schools, of what have you, the mass expulsion of people. This does not belong to our age and time. This should have been in the 30s and much before the 30s. This is the dark age. I warn 
that Israel in the last six weeks have succeeded in normalizing horror. Right. So, so, so do you believe then that the response to that will be an increase in support for armed struggle by Palestinians? I don't know what I'll believe, but I, I just want to wait for the first moment I could go and cuddle my sister, cuddle all of my family and all of my friends and really hug very tight the children there. Of course, but if that is the normality, then don't you think that there will be a reaction? And I think we should be so concerned now because we must, we must nurture our children with love and we must eradicate any source of hate in their hearts and we must direct their energy towards a better future and the challenge will be immense to do so. So yes, we are all concerned. Do you think sure. eradicating hate in the hearts of this generation of children who have lived through this war is possible? Yes, it is possible because we as humans, be it Palestinians, be it uh, British, be it Israeli, we, we are always oriented by hope. The biggest enemy of security and stability is hopelessness. It's our duty to give these children hope and protection and forgiveness and to tell them that all those who committed these crimes will be brought to international justice. Accountability is key. Look what happened in South Africa. But you don't believe that, do you? We, I don't, I believe in that. And we, we I, I personally, if you want to ask me where would I spend the rest of my life, it's not going to be in anything but one word. One word, accountability. You know why? <clears throat> because if we don't hold those who committed these atrocities to account, we're waiting for the next tragedy. We want to make sure that those who committed these accounts are behind international bars or but justice has to be served. Okay. Or, or else they will do it again. Does so that this apply? Is, so this is a deterrence. This is a deterrence. But does that apply to you, to the other, to the to Hamas? All sides. Anyone. So those Hamas... And it's anyone. Fighters who went into Israel should also be held to justice and account and be behind bars. Anyone, any party that committed war crimes in my country, that's how we went to the ICC. We submitted an, uh, a request to give the ICC full mandate. And in that mandate, we said, you come and investigate war crimes and crimes against humanity by anybody in the land of the occupied state of Palestine. And the ICC came out and said, we have the full mandate now. But uh, unfortunately, the ICC has been dragging its feet, not, not for legal reasons. Legality has been bluntly clear for political reasons. And because, would you hand them over? Because countries like the US and the UK have been have been blocking the ICC from doing its duty of fulfilling its mandate of investigating war crimes and bringing those who commit war crimes. And the question is, why countries like the US and the UK would deprive the Palestinian people from peaceful legal means to create deterrence so sh this should not happen again? This is the real question. Why the West goes out of its way all the time to shield Israel? Why, why Israel is allowed to drag the West all the time into its immoral abyss, into its immoral wars. And look at the situation now. But then now. that's very interesting. Look at the situation now. It's almost sound, and I hope we will treat this very, 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 very fastly. It almost feels like, like it's, a, it's, a, it's an East-West issue, rather than it's a legal political issue that should be resolved in line with our human system, which is the international law and international system. But you th so you then have explained that Hamas are your political rivals, you believe war crimes should be held to account, that people should go to courts and be put behind bars if they're found guilty. You've talked about the horrors that Palestinian children faced and still face, yet the dialogue you have had since October the 7th has been a continuous one of refusing to criticize your own people in your terms, refusing to condemn, refu you know, that whole conversation that is repeated over and over again in the media. Um, we, we have of, 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 not, of not condemning the Hamas attack. So, so why is it that if, they, if you, you disagree with them politically, they are your rivals, you think wrong has been done, why is it that you're well, unable then to let, say let what they explain. did was wrong? Let, let me explain this, let me explain. Because this has been going on in the Western media for a long, long time. Um, this is about a matter of principle and standards. If you, 
you, the Western media, manage to apply the same standards on anybody, you will get different answers. But I have to charge you of double standards, of hypocrisy and selectivity. Because the horrors and the crimes that Israel has committed against my people over the last 75 years is recorded, documented. Two thirds of my people were ethnically cleansed in 48, including my own parents. And I was born in a refugee camp. And the horrors of that time is repeated as we speak. So you can imagine what happened 75 years ago because it's happening now in Gaza and in the West Bank. Yet, you don't sit in that seat and bring the Israeli officials here or ambassadors and tell them, do you condemn? Do you condemn the arrest of Palestinian children, rounding them without trial, charges, uh, uh, leaving them in... Do you condemn? Well, that, and that, that, let's, let's be careful, let, though, because don't, no, don't, don't, don't no, lump no, all no, the media no, in no, together. No, 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 I am, I am, I am, I haven't. Uh, I have not seen... You interviewed the Israeli ambassador two weeks ago. You haven't. I haven't see, heard you saying, do you condemn? Oh, uh, this is not I about you. I put to her the whole no, question no, 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 of war crimes you didn't. Many and not times. only you, not only you, the BBC, the Skies, the CNNs, the Foxes, everybody. So this is about... Equity. This is about the equality of treatment. That's number one. Number two, we are not the aggressors here. The source of aggression, the source of violence is the military occupation. Everything else is a reaction. The instigator of all this is the state of martial art that we have been subjected to for the last 75 years. And I say 75 years, not 56 years, because it's an extension of the Nakba. And until, until we realize that we have to think about our terminology, our position is clear, and I've said it in many interviews. I said we reject wholeheartedly, completely, the targeting of any civilian from all sides, from day one. But you see, the question about condemnation is in effect, and the lack of asking the Israeli ambassador's representatives the same question, is in effect to make me accept the notion that our people are less important, that our lives matter less, because when Israel kills 15,000 and the Israelis don't get asked that question, and I do, then I would accept with your question that our lives matter less. But we might, shall never do that. You see, about... it's a matter of principle, Krishnan. It's not a matter of policy. Our policy is clear. Yeah. And this business has, has gone on for a long time. And add to that, add to that, the moment your colleagues ask that question in the international media is a moment before I answer, is when your audience and viewers would immediately get the impression that violence comes from our side and Israel is always in a state of self-defense. Maybe sometimes it overreact, but self-defense. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. It's the other way around. I mean, oh, this has obviously been going on every for decades, act, which is what... Every which is act, what, every, which is what so, last, last yeah. sentence, every act of violence, every act of terrorism comes from the occupying state and everything else is a react to that. That's the truth. But, it, but in every instance, in every eruption, there is something that sets it off. And of course, and as I, I have said to the Israeli ambassador, this is, this is not something that started on October the 7th. This is something that is set in decades of history, a century of history. Um, but on October the 7th, there was an attack. There was a reaction to that attack. It, I'm not saying anything started on October the 7th. No, no, you no. Know. there was no reaction to that attack. I just explained to you what happened since then was not a reaction, was an action by Israel for ethnic cleansing. So it was not a reaction to what Hamas did on the 7th. It wasn't. It was a, a plan well, on that, the table. That's a matter of opinion. You can't opinion, say that the fact. But, you opinion, know. ask the UN. Ask the UN, they will tell you what has taken place since the 7th. You are talking about a very classic case. Go back to the Balkans and see what happened. It's the same. Of course, in our case, no, 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 but you're a, saying it was designed. It was designed. Uh, of the, course, the, the, was the, the fact, so the fact please, that people have been we have to correct moved. this. It was not a react to the seventh of October. It was an act of aggression designed before. They used the seventh of October to unfold it. Well, they used the seventh of October to play it out. That's it. Well, I accept that's a theory, but, but I mean, it's it, not. It's something, a practice. It's well, it's not it's, something that can be proven. Just yet. How do you define? I'm sorry. Let's not play with words. What, how can you describe, as a very established, uh, prominent journalist, the displacement of 1.7 million people and destruction of their homes and livelihoods? Most prominent lawyers on earth, army of lawyers. Now, talking about genocide, you want to disqualify all these people? No, no, no. But what I'm saying, but what you've gone, you've gone a step further in that you said. Uh, 
you know, that this, that this was planned by Israel, if, in, in effect. That this was no, no, not, it wasn't. You know, no, no. And, is, and was Israel there. says, is, in Israeli was there. terms... It's an old new plan. It's there. It's okay, it was drawers. a plan ready to be put into... It's there. Ready to be put into action in your terms. In Israel's terms, obviously, they say we were attacked and we've reacted. So, you know, whichever is the ultimate truth, maybe we, maybe we, we don't get to and we certainly Hamas, won't settle is here. Is Hamas in control of the West Bank? No, right? You know, you know, okay? Leave Gaza aside. Every, do you know that it was just announced as Israel was attacking Gaza, there was an announcement of hundreds of millions of funding by the Israeli government to build the new settlements yesterday. Yeah. What is that? Uh, how, how, how do you describe that in legal and political terms? Have you followed settler terrorism in the last six weeks? Have you, have you reported settler terrorism? Have you seen them burning villages? Have you reported the depopulation of entire villages in the West Bank? So what is that? Oh, Hamas doesn't exist there. So you sit here, Krishna, and tell me, this is a war on Hamas. This is a war on our people that has been lasting for 75 years, relentless, non-ending. And regrettably, with such an international scene, with such a Western way of coping with us, it's not stopping. But that's why I'm asking you about the... I accept this is a long war, OK? But, but it has moments that erupt like this. And this is a moment that has erupted. So when on October the 7th, you see what has happened in Israel, and there are over a thousand people dead there, you know that there are then going to be thousands of people of your own people killed. Uh, so so, so what, what is, because you know that there's, it's, going to, it's going to get worse. Okay. So, so what is your, you know, you're, 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 you're then going on to television after television and being asked, you know, do you condemn the attack and what's going to happen now and how do you avoid a, uh, a, a protracted war? Do you not feel, as somebody who has lost people in this war, that your heart sinks when you see an eruption like the Hamas attack on October the 7th? Because you know what's happening. You know what's going to happen then. Yes, but my heart sinks. Because and you don't support violence. Yeah, yes, yeah, so, of course I don't. Of course I don't. But my heart sinks because I know what the Israelis will do. My heart sinks because I have the record. My heart sinks because I follow the racism, the supremacy in Israel. Yeah. My heart sinks because I hear them when they say, nuke them. I hear their ministers. My heart sinks when I see the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, quoting something, the Amalek, from the Bible, which is the inhalation, you know, the extermination of everybody, children, women, you know that story. My heart sinks. And make no mistake, the, the missiles that killed my family are Israeli missiles. So my, my, my heart sank because I knew what was to come from the Israeli side. By the way... But isn't that a sign uh, of maturity uh, uh, within uh, a people? Uh, if you can disagree within yourselves uh, and uh, say, that is wrong, this is right? Our international order was based on two premises. The first is war should never be the first option after the horrors of the Second World War. Second, should war be an option as a last resort, there are rules. Third, there has to be accountability when war is conducted. Israel has ransacked the three. Ransacked is the wrong word. Has demolished the three completely, you know that. And we need to go back to our sanity. We now need to go, was it really the, the first choice war? Hamas is a group, a militant group. Was it the first choice? I'll tell you one thing. The Qataris offered Israel the release of all, the, all, the, all those people who were released early on, five weeks ago. So we could have saved 15,000 people. 75% are women and children, but Israel re refused. You tell me why Israel would refuse to get what it is getting now, because they want their hostages back. Because they want to finish the job they did. And without the pressure that was built by the people, not the governments, in your streets, here in London, in Manchester, in Scotland, in Wales, everywhere, and all over the world, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in the Arab world, without that pressure, Israel would have carpet bombed the entire Gaza. So now we need to go back to our rules. And we need to, back to, uh, to go back to our legal definitions. Are we under occupation or not, Krishna? Are we a people under occupation? Do you know what the British government designate our territory? You know the official legal name that the, 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 the foreign office here uh, designate for us? The OPT. You know what's the OPT? The Occupied Palestinian Territory. So we are occupied, right? The question is, in such situation, an occupier, Israel, a colonizer, Israel, a besieger Israel and an occupied oppressed people. Can you call this a war? Do you have two armies to even use the term war? No. What you need to use and go back to the UN, go back to international legal experts. 
This is an oppression, a repression, like that of white South African apartheid regime. A suppression against people who are suppressed. So war does not happen between such, in such dynamics. That's number one. Number two, who has the right to de defend themselves in such situation? Is it the occupier or the occupied? Think with me. For so long, the world has adopted terminologies and words that have led to the killing of our children that have flipped things upside down for decades. It's we who have the right to defend itself, not the occupier. And if it is an occupier, there is the four Geneva Convention that our humanity created. So if you are, if you are operating an occupation, it is your full responsibility as an occupier to provide full protection for civilians and services. Services, education, health, what have you, to the occupied people. Does Israel ever in its history abide by these rules? And then we sit here and we discuss this Palestinian group, and then 10 years ago, that Palestinian group, and then Israel goes and invades Lebanon, remember in the 80s, because of Fatah, the national, the national movement, and Yasser Arafat. History is repeating itself. Well, let's just because come. Because we do not want to focus on the root cause. Let's just come to the, the root the current. cause is Israel's illegal military, colonial, colonial military occupation. You think Hamas created the Arab Israeli conflict? Or you think the Arab Israeli conflict created Hamas? Which one? It's conflicts that create these of groups. Of course. Right? Right? So let's not keep focusing 100% of our time but let, on the then, groups. Then let's come to the current, because so, so, this is really important, because we're, we're currently in a situation so, where your belief is that Israel wants to occupy Gaza and take it over, yes? Uh, my belief, uh, uh, Israel wants to depopulate Gaza. And to depopulate, and, to, and for the Palestinian people to go somewhere. To Sinai. To, to, oh, to Egypt. Sinai. And... Yeah, yes. And uh, go... Right. So Listen we'll... to the Israeli officials, please. They have said it. Yeah. So, well, some of them certainly have. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, so, so what do you believe is the alternative that is, that, is, that is possible without a Palestinian state? Let's just stay constitutionally within the current framework. Do you believe the Palestinian Authority is in a position to administer Gaza, given the people of Gaza wanted Hamas? Well, there is only one solution, uh, and that solution uh, is there if we want it. It's been sitting there for a long time. It lacked international political will. The solution, there is already a state of Palestine. It's recognized by 141 states. There is a Palestinian government, and we need to make sure that that state and that government can provide for its people in Gaza, in Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. We will never accept to deal with Gaza in a partial way or in a military and security way. There is no military solutions in Gaza, in, in the West Bank, or anywhere else. There has to be a comprehensive solution. And of course, matters need to be discussed. But it is the state of Palestine that needs to be dealt with by the international community. It is the state of Palestine that needs to be empowered via recognition of the countries that didn't until now, especially the UK. And you know why? Because of the historic responsibility of the UK, the Balfour Declaration that then t turned us at the time into non-Jewish minorities when we were the natives of the land for thousands of years and the cardinal of civilizations. We all go to the UN and the US and the UK removed their veto from us becoming full member state in the, in the United Nations system. We sit as mature community of nations and we sort all this out. Palestinians have an address. Palestinians have a government, Palestinians have a flag, and Palestinians are united because of their suffering and oppression. They face the same oppression. These bullets do not distinguish between them wherever they are, and they are united by their goal. So this, is, this, this, this could also be a moment of unity. So, uh, so your answer is give us a state. Yeah. But my, my, my no, question no, no, my is answer, before we get to that, uh, it, it, does you cannot, FATA, you, do you, does you your organization have the capability of governing the Palestinian people given in Gaza, they chose Hamas the last time they were asked. And right now, as we've already established, the, 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 the support for armed struggle and the lack of faith in what so-called democracy in the West Bank has, has delivered is, is weakened. Again, again, I started by telling you, uh, we are mixing between states and government on one hand and political parties. So as if you're telling me the, the conservative or the Labour, this is not the discussion. This is about the British government and the British state. Now, <clears throat> about uh, the PLO as a government, it has the full legitimacy. 
it has the full legitimacy. And the PLO, as a, as a government of the state, that will be uh, providing for its people in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, will convene elections in all these areas and let people decide. Let our people decide. And let the world accept whatever our people decide. And don't you think Israel, when, you, when, when Israel reads your solution, which is create the Palestinian state now and then negotiate the details, won't they say, you're basically asking us to let Hamas win. Well, and we're not prepared to do that. All these pretexts. Before that, they would say, oh, you are letting Fatah uh, win because they considered us before that the terrorists. You know, we're still, the PLO still designated. But it's not the, realistic, is it? Yeah, After it is, 1,400 it is, people are it dead. Is, it is realistic. There is no way you can piecemeal this. It has to be a big bang. And now. And then we can drill backward. Just swallow the pain, is now, what you're saying. No, no, no. We can drill backward because we started by saying we need to give people hope. We need, we need to give people sense of direction and sense of travel. We need to bring all this awful negative energy and turn it into a positive momentum. So there is no time for small measures now, I assure you. It has to be a big bang. And I think it's possible. The two-state solution has an international consensus. Consensus. So why not to implement it? And when you want to implement it? If you go back and deal with Gaza alone, and who's going to govern here, and who's going to govern there, and don't get into Palestinian-Palestinian conversation. Leave Palestinian-Palestinian conversations to us. This is about the implementation of the international consensus. The world wanted to implement it 30 years ago, and they dragged their feet. Perhaps this is the time. 30 years is long enough for not implementing your own policy. Well, I mean, the, the reason I ask you about Palestine, Palestinian versus Palestinian is because you have to create something stable. And it's not clear whether you would be able to because you, you, you have these two forces within... You know, this is very... I'm, I'll, I'll tell you again, this is also the, the colonial mindset. I'm sorry, I'm not saying you're no, colonial. No. no, it is. And I'm not, it is, it is, it is. I'll tell you, it's, it comes from Israel. Oh, the Palestinians are mismanaged. Oh, the Palestinians cannot govern themselves. Oh, we left Gaza and look what happened. All that. They, it's all of their making. Because the Palestinians are the, you know, historically before Israel was created, we were the light in the region. We were educating the region. And now, after the Nakba, look who builds the Gulf and builds the region. And the Palestinians have a governance. And by the way, we are hearing from many international uh, officials that our institutions, including the World Bank, by the way, our state-like institutions are at the level of middle-income countries. It's a pretext by Israel just to keep saying, oh, these poor people, we have to occupy them. Look, look at the knowledge. We have to oppress them. We, we really don't want to kill them, but we have to kill but, them. But would Hamas ever and when stop they, and saying when, he wants to listen, remove Israel? That's listen, the point, listen. isn't it? We can govern ourselves, and I assure you... Yes, but would assure, Hamas but ever stop wanting let, to destroy let, Israel? We, we, cannot, we cannot convene normal... normal uh, 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 Hamas is not just its military wing, right? That's what I wrote in The Economist. Hamas is also an ideology. You want to defeat an ideology by bullets? by Israeli huge rockets bombarding entire neighborhoods. That's how you defeat ideologies. You only defeat an idea by presenting a different idea, which I'm, I'm presenting you now. So give people the choice to choose which future they want to. Israel has been giving people one choice, one choice only, be oppressed. You know what? It was talked about by the current finance minister of Israel, Smotrich. Either you accept to live as a slave in a plan he published, slave in your own homeland, us, or oh, oh, you are depopulated, expelled, and we will facilitate, he says in his plan, we will facilitate that expulsion. Number three, you will be dealt with by our army, i.e. killed. So this is the context. But we you, you presented so, an alternative idea. You yeah, this is the alternative. Which is, which is OK, we'll, our alternative idea is our statehood. Um, what gives you the confidence that the... That, that, the presence of a Palestinian state that is universally recognized and is a, 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 it is a proper country at last, um, would stop those people in Hamas wanting to destroy Israel. Because that is the requirement. But that's not the, that's not the mandate of the state, my friend. Our mandate is not that. Our mandate to provide for our people, protect our people. Uh, and once we protect our people and provide for them, like all other states, and make sure that our, our citizens are safe and provide for them opportunities, 
all this will you not, think the, the struggle all the, will all, the, all this will not become even a discussion that's number one number two once that happened the state is materialized you will have underwriters you will have the entire arab world you have the arab peace initiative who will underwrite the security of both israel and palestine who will come heavily in them in terms of in, uh, their investment and you have the international community the u.s has been saying all all, all along and the, and the eu they will underwrite this so israel will have sufficient sufficient guarantees and lastly we will cross that bridge when we get get to it but stop saying i have to keep killing you because i don't trust that you will provide security stop killing me stop occupying me stop colonizing my, 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 my land get the hell out of the land and then we will discuss if your security concerns is not met but i assure you once this major illegality ends security architecture can be built governance ar architectural can be built unless you think people are violent by nature krishnan people are by nature more oriented towards raising their children wherever they are towards making sure that they, their children have the best education, the best economic opportunities. This is our people, this is your people, and this is every people. I, I asked the Israeli ambassador whether she could empathize with the Palestinian people. And what and did she struggle. say? She, 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 she would not say that she does. Mm. Um, so let me ask you the same question. Do you empathize with Israelis who fear being attacked? in their beds. I empathize with every fear human being. Taken I empathize with every human being. Uh, I, I really do empathize with every human being who, who suffers the consequences of the system of racial domination that has been erected in our, in, in our uh, land from the whole historic Palestine. This system of racial uh, uh, domination and oppression and suppression has many victims, including many Israelis. Um, including many Israelis. Many Israelis suffer because of the uh, expansion of their, of their country. But do you empathize with the fear? East, eastward, that, that eastward, they will east, feel. eastward. Many, many, many of them are victims of the settler project. Look, the last year, I'm sure you followed the hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the streets of Israel protesting Netanyahu and his government for wanting to change the Supreme Court mandate yeah. and what have you. So, you know, for a couple of years, people are talking about more than a couple of years, for 10, 10, 10 years, that it's, it's, Israel is going to annex the settlements, remember? You know what effectively happened? It's the settlements that annexed Israel. Yeah. And that's why you had all but the administration. But right now, there and are I'm many, saying many this, Israelis course, who, are just, who, who fear for their lives. They believe there are going to be Palestinian gunmen coming to kill them. And the idea of giving them a state and giving them legitimacy and turning that into an army okay, instead of I, a militia I, terrifies them. Well, I Do you empathize with that fear? I, I empathize with them, and I hope they empathize with the Palestinian people who not only fear that they will have Israeli soldiers coming their way, they are actually <laughs> receiving these soldiers every day. What Israel saw on the 7th of October is what Palestinians experience almost on a regular basis. So maybe this is a time that because of what they have gone through, the Israelis, will really pause, think, hold something in their, in their heart, and think what has happened to the other side for 75 years. Maybe I would like to see, for once, a real demonstration, a huge demonstration in Tel Aviv, calling for a ceasefire, immediate ceasefire. Maybe I want to see people to really talk about the occupation, and that occupation not only corrupts and deprives us of our humanity, occupation corrupts them first and foremost. Look at the history of mankind. Look at all cases of people who gone out and colonized and occupied people. It has affected their, their constituencies, affected their culture, their behavior so much. Look at the violence inside Israel. Look how Israelis drive in the streets. You will know that this occupation is really wrecking, wrecking every human being in that, in that society, in Israel. So I also want to see them now waking up, not what I see in terms of the sheer quest for, for revenge, uh, the racism, the hatred, the statements that I could not believe that they belong to our time and age. So I, I, I add my voice to yours, but definitely as a Palestinian and as somebody who was born in a refugee camp, as a son of the Nakba, myself, I can only sympathize when, 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 with anybody who suffers what my people have been suffering of. So, so <laughs> Again, then, if, you, if you've presented your, 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 your option, you say you, it's a time for a big moment, a big, a big, a big risk, a big bang. Risk. Do you, do, you, do you have any faith that the regional powers and the United States, which are the keys, will support anything like that? Yes, 100%, not 99%.
Why? The region is... Uh, uh, why? I just came from a meeting with all Arab ambassadors. What is happening in Gaza and in Palestine now is affecting existentially the whole region. Aren't you following? Egypt believes that Israel wants to push the Palestinians and resolve the Palestinian issue at the expense of the national security of Egypt. Jordan knows that Israel is planning the same in the West Bank. Uh, Lebanon is engaged in this whole thing. Yemen, Iraq, Syria was bombed by Israel and by the U.S. The region is on, on a tipping point. And the international community have seen, the West particularly, that this is not a conflict that is only in the Middle East. You've seen that it is here. And you've seen some politicians here who wanted to create rifts between communities here, right? Should we mention names? You've seen how heated the debate here and the outpouring emotions in the streets of London and, and Manchester and, and, and Cardiff and Glasgow and everywhere. And the world is watching this. This is a global issue because the people of the world, including the British people, do not go out in the streets and there are hundreds of thousands only because they are pro-Palestine. No, because they are pro their own democracy, their own values, their own rules, their own freedoms because they see that Israel is corrupting their own countries. They see that Israel is corrupting and depriving them of rights that were created after wars and horrors, like the right to speak, like the right to boycott, right, like, like the right to mobilize. But I asked you about the United States. Are and you, are the you right saying to the protest? United States so, is going to back? So now Israel has exposed itself as a, a danger, not only on the Palestinian people, it's a danger on our international system. Look, they have bombed. They have not only violated, Israel has not only violated international law, they have bombed international law. They have bombed more than 50 UN facilities. You know that. They have been after- But you know what their justification is. Don't, I mean, I mean, what, we, just, what justification? You know. Why didn't you ask the justification for it? It has never happened before. So why Israel has a justification? And one, why can Israel get away with stuff? Now people are watching and that's why they are losing well, faith. Well, that's the question. Why do you they, think? They are losing why, faith. Why do you think? They're losing faith. That, that more hospitals can be bombed, more journalists can be killed, more aid workers can be killed, and yet it, it carries on. Yeah, you, ask, you answer me that question, Christian, and I mean it. You know, just I was, I, I was driving, I was talking to a friend and I told him, I don't understand. Why, when it comes to Israel, the West uh, uh, enable itself to be dragged but into what's the, this? But what's the answer? You tell why? me. I, 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 you know, why, why, why? Especially when we have Ukraine and especially when we have all these issues. And it, it's been 75 years. Why always the West drags itself into this immoral, immoral situation? Well, let me ask you bluntly. Do you think it's anti-Arab racism? It could be. It could, uh, part of it could be that, yes. Uh, a part of politicians, yes. Uh, uh, it could be, uh, uh, it could be politicians who calculate all the time in terms of elections and, and votes and numbers and support. <clears throat> it could be media and the way media has been framing this for a long time. It could be religion because there is the Christian Zionist stream that started before Zionism. An element in it, in it could be strategic, i.e. we need an Israel as an extension of the colonial powers in the Middle East to be the hegemon in the region. It could be many things, but whatever it is, the West has really allowed itself to uh, be seen as partisan in this, to be seen completely one-sided, off balance, and to be seen as not very honest when it comes to the implementation of rules they created after the Second World War. And this, I'm afraid, if it continues this way, we will lose the biggest thing we have achieved after the horrors of all these wars, which is our system. But you, you know say what? that as if it's a surprise. How, how can you be surprised that the West is, is partisan? The West has gone through many phases, including the colonial era. You know, Britain has taken control of Palestine, the mandate. <clears throat> I am one of those who believe that after the mid-40s uh, and the famous uh, uh, call by the US, Woodrow Wilson of the right of nations for self-determination and the establishment of the UN New York, I thought for once that the West wants to be uh, the founder and the champion of international rules, the rules-based international order. I might be mistaken. So you now believe that the United States would support the idea of a big bang, even though everything they are saying publicly is to support Israel in, <clears throat> quote, defending itself? Yes, I believe because the US has no other choice. There's no other choice. 
If you want this to end, if you want a sustainable solution, there is no other alternative. It's an empowered, supported state of Palestine. Otherwise, we are just waiting for the next tragedy. And this is not the first time Israel attacks Gaza. It's the fifth in almost, you know, a child who is 12 years old. I've seen five wars, five wars. Okay, this is the most intense, the most horrific, the biggest mass slaughter. But 2014, I lost count. I think almost 2,000 people were slaughtered by Israel. So <clears throat> somebody who's in his 15 years old now have, have gone through five wars. So, well, we wait for the sixth. We wait for the, for the next pogrom in the West Bank. Pogrom, I'm sorry. The next attack against our civilians. Yes, the U.S. has no choice. And the region is ready, and the world is ready, and the plan is there. And it was UN Security Council resolutions, the two-state solution. We have 83 UN Security Council resolutions that were drafted and voted for by the US and the UK. Implement them. Implement them. And I'm not even mentioning the 900 or so UN General Assembly uh, uh, resolutions. So what's strange? What is strange in us asking for implementation of UN Security Council resolutions? Why should we explain ourselves and justify? Oh, oh, and do you believe that a, a state could be created without the right of return? N don't negotiate with me. This is negotiations now. No, I'm just asking you. I mean, if you, if you, no, if you no, put together I, an idea, I, no, it's got to be realistic, hasn't no, it? No, you, so, can, you can't. You cannot negotiate any solution without more than half of your people. Otherwise, you haven't achieved peace. Otherwise, you haven't resolved anything. But again, there are international standards as happened in the Balkans and everywhere else. There are international standards that must be applied. The right of return is absolutely non-negotiable in terms of it being a private right before it is a national right. But there are so many models, so many international standards, so many international organizations to deal with this. The one requirement, stop making Israel the exception to all these rules, stop. Like, oh, what about if Palestinian refugees come back? They should. It's their homes. It's their farms. It's their livelihoods. What is this making Palestinian refugees as if... And by the way, let me tell you something. We've gone through so many final negotiations with Israel, at Camp David and before yeah, it and after. And that's the stumbling block. Not, no. No. It was never the refugees. In fact, as far as the refugee issue, there was a great deal of promising conversations from both sides and with the U.S. and the international mediation. It was Jerusalem, never the refugees, never. But you see, because Israel wants its occupation to be permanent, because Israel is real, and I don't mean by Israel every Israeli, I mean the governments, they are always after pretexts. One of it is we left Gaza, look Hamas, what will happen if we create a state, they will come and attack us. One of it is the refugees. So what happens to One Jerusalem? One of the pretexts is refugees. One of the pre Jerusalem, there are international resolutions we accept it. You know, it is shared. Is that just to be yeah, just yeah, to yeah, yeah. lay it out? It would be a shared city. Yes, we accepted the international resolutions, the UN Security Council resolutions, that East Jerusalem is a Palestinian occupied city, and Israel must end its occupation of that city. Now, all that was offered to us was much less than that, and we cannot accept. Let me explain this. Many people around the world, and I'll say it through your program, think, believe that the two-state solution is a Palestinian demand. No, it's not. The two-state solution is a Palestinian concession. Because by the late 80s, we were proposing, the PLO was proposing one democratic egalitarian state for all of its citizens, be it Muslim, be it Christians, be it Jews. That was our political platform. But the world, i.e. the West-led world, primarily the US, proposed something else. They said, no, 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 we have to party the land. Huh? Two-state solution. By the late 80s, Yasser Arafat and the founders of the movement decided to ally ourselves with international resolutions, and therefore, we accepted the two-state solution. Not as our demand, but as a compromise. Now, here is the deal. We cannot accept less than the, than the 67 borders, and we will not offer, I mean, Israel keeps negotiating with us, not how do we achieve the 67 borders? No, no, they want to arrive somewhere between Jerusalem and Jericho, you know the map. So they want to bite more of the 22% of historic Palestine. That is the 67 uh, borders. And they don't understand that for any Palestinian leader, 
they will never be able to accept less than what was offered by UN Security Council, and they can never give more. This is the bone. This is the line. So I think now with all that happened, let's go for that line. Let these two states, let's level the field. Let's level the field. And let, let the world and the region come as underwriters, give everybody the security and the, the, the opportunity and the economic assistance. And let us as two states equal, equal among nations. There is the seat of a full member for the state of Palestine next to the seat of Israel. But you, and, then, you know, and then we discuss these gritty nitty details. There will be so many details. What kind but of right economic? now we have a situation where Israel's stated aim is, remains to destroy Hamas. So you know that as soon as this period of ceasefire is over, whenever it is over, it will have to go back to war in some form, won't it? <clears throat> Otherwise, it accepts defeat. Yeah, that will be the failure of the U.S. and the international community if Israel does so. A big, big failure. And I don't, I cannot begin to tell you what would be the consequences of that. <clears throat> you know, Israel is talking about Hamas. I don't think well, what will come in place of Hamas if Israel continues on that path. Something worse. Way worse. Way worse. Humans are humans. And I don't think, I don't, I don't even want to begin to assess the consequences, not only in Palestine. So it would be like destroying Al-Qaeda and not, creating ISIS? Not, not, only, not only in Palestine, but in the region, and I'm following, and worldwide. This is very serious. That's why we need leadership now and statesmanship. We need wise people, unlike the last six weeks when we heard from all Western capitals, Israel has the right to defend itself. Hang on. Hang on. Don't give them carte blanche. Don't give them a green light. You have to say that this must be done within the rules we agreed on. This is a time when we really tell Israel, okay, you want to be a member of this family of nations. You have got to be, perform. You have got to behave like the rest of the nations. So what is your answer to when Joe Biden, whoever it is, says, okay, but wouldn't the message that is being sent to every armed group in the world be, if you just go and kill a load of people and start a war, you'll get your own way? For instance, that's why I told you the first rule of the international system was war should never be the first option. Yeah, but it was in yeah, this case. No, so, it wasn't. I, I would argue that there would have been many, many, many venues other than the war and the aggression Israel did that would have, if it continues, it would create shockwaves that nobody will be able to deal with. No, it wasn't the first option. But what that is your was, answer to that, that question? Was, of no, saying, so, so, you, so Ambassador, you, you're you, saying uh, give us no, a no, state. No, not, Doesn't uh, that uh, just uh, send uh, the uh, message uh, that if you go and kill a load of civilians, no, no, you'll no, get come, no, a no, state? No, no, come on, come on. This is, the very wrong, this is the very wrong way to look at it because for 75 years we've been saying give us a state. For the last 30 years we have been engaged in a process. <clears throat> what we are saying that, what we are saying now, you see, for 25 years, Netanyahu has been trying to argue one case and not only argue, do, that the Israeli occupation is permanent, that he can bypass the Palestinian uh, issue. And you know all what he did. I don't need to give you the numbers. What I'm trying to tell you, perhaps this is not only a tragedy, and it is the biggest tra tragedy in our history so far, after the Nakba. Perhaps this is an opportunity to tell the world and tell Netanyahu, stop there. You cannot bypass the Palestinian uh, uh, issue. Security first option does not work. No military solution against people. You cannot give, uh, kill thousands of women and children like this. You cannot bombard our own UN system. I think this is possible. And if it's not possible, then you will invite me again after a few months to discuss another tragedy. There is no other solution but to uproot the cause, the root of all this. There is no other solution. We have got to just hit it straight ahead on its head. And this is the moment. This is the moment. And you tell me that this, is, this will be a reward? No. No. If you believe that it was done to create violence, then this is not the reward. This is punishment. Because people will be gearing much more towards peace, towards hope, towards coexistence, towards partnership, towards trading. This is what we need to create, as opposed to the sickness that we keep hearing from Netanyahu and his elk. And for 75 years, Israel has been trying a lot of carrots, more carrots, more trade, more arms deals. You've seen the ships, didn't you, in the last six weeks? The poor Gaza, I mean, I mean the US, the UK, everyone else. How about the stick? 
how about we try something called sanctions? Have you heard of it? Sanctions that was tried everywhere when somebody crosses the line. Do I need to tell the world how many times Israel has been crossing the lines? How many lines have been completely demolished? This is a time when we say enough, enough. And this is a time when we say rules do equally, uh, do equally apply. At the time of Ukraine, I mean, the U.S. support the resistance in Ukraine and send all of the weapons and what have you. And then in our case, immediately to send this air wave of whatever <coughs> to the occupier. This is not going to create peace. I think, <coughs> I think the U.S. has gotten to a point now and the U.K. The Secretary General, uh, I'm sorry, the Foreign Secretary David Cameron was in Ramallah in Palestine only two days ago. Everybody realized it, realized. I think everybody is saying in their head, and I mean by everybody, politicians, states, you know, leaders, everybody is saying, ops, ops. Everybody is saying, for too long we allowed Israel to undermine the PA, undermine the PA in the military sense, in the financial sense, in the political sense, in the legal sense. We have allowed Israel to keep this division between the Palestinians. And everybody realizes now the solution is with the Palestinian people and their legitimate representation and their state. And everybody knows that without this, there is the alternative. The alternative is mayhem. The alternative is the Armageddon. And therefore, this is a moment when the U.S. has to be true to itself and the rest of the world and come and be the grown-up in the room. Enough, enough of the partisan. Yeah. Enough, uh, the U.S. has done enough of the partisan. The grown-up on the, on the, in the room, on the table, not only for our sake, but for your sake. And do you think it would be a democracy? What, Palestine? Yes. We are the only, one of the few in the Middle East that could with be... A, with a full democratic culture no, and pluralism no, no. and different political parties and different leaders, because... Listen, we might... Because people are looking, uh, at, looking, at, looking at Mahmoud Abbas and going, listen, is that it? Listen, listen. We are the, President Abbas convened national elections just a few months after he was elected by his people as the president of Palestine, of the state of Palestine. And he convened national elections. And you know, when we convene it, we bring the world to Moneta. And at the time, it was uh, uh, President Carter who came and many others. And I remember I was there. President Carter said, this is the most uh, transparent democratic elections I've seen. But it was a long time ago. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. But we have the institutional memory, we have the institutional capacity, and we have the personnel, very grand people, who are independent, like Hanna Nasser. Dr. Hanna Nasser is the, is the founder of our uh, biggest, most respected university, Birzeit. We have it, and we've done it before. So, And by the way, <clears throat> let me say this from my heart. We might not be, the Palestinian people, the, great, the greatest nation on earth, but I don't think there is any nation that is greater than us. In terms of our education, our, our, our contribution to humanity, I think we can not only uh, make, uh, uh, make our, uh, ourselves proud of our state, it will be a very exceptional state in the positive sense. And look at the numbers. We have one of the lowest illiteracy rate in the world. We have one of the highest PhD graduate per capita, per capita, PhD graduates in the world. Here in London, I receive hundreds of Palestinians who are now in the city, in the, you know, social media, at the director and CEOs and all these levels. Such a nation cannot really build itself enough. We will build it in the most democratic way, and you will come and see the beauty of that. I mean, right now, you sound very hopeful. Because I, um, I, I, I know my people. The problem of my people is not the lack of that. We have convened national elections, and when Hamas won, we handed the keys. We are democratic, and we believe that our most significant weapon is democracy, is the power of our people. But this is not the issue. The issue is, can you convene very normal uh, uh, elections in the absence of sovereignty? Because then the occupier will dictate, and that's what has been happening, either negatively, uh, by design, by omission, or by commission. So we definitely, the requirement for all that is that this occupation leaves, just leave, and everything else will fall into place. Everything else, democracy, security, prosperity, and it's racist. But, but that's why I say it's a risk. It is racist. So ask me to say, <coughs> peace security is will based come. on risk. Because if you sit in your comfortable zone and say, I cannot achieve peace because I've, I'm afraid of this, then you will not achieve. Peace needs leadership. Peace needs need you to be brave 
and take the consequences. And of course, even when you are at it, even with the Big Bang, there will be groups and people from all over who want to derail you. Be set on, stay the course, be a leader, believe in what you do, and take your people with you to a different direction. That applies on us, that applies on Israel, that applies on everybody else. But all this politician-like talk is just populism, feeding the anger, feeding the hurt, feeding the worst in our humanity. I think, I think this is a moment when we can flip it and we can feed the best in us, and it is. Because if we do not turn this tragedy into a momentum, we are doomed, my friend. Doomed. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time.